fasting, gout, and keto. Should you or should you not? And we start right now. So in this week's broadcast, uh, which I'm pre-recording because I will be on the road on Friday, we are going to focus on a question that came in in the comments section on my YouTube channel, which asked me about my opinion on fasting. So today we're going to cover this. Remember, there has been a recurrent theme through all of the presentations that I've, that I've given, and I'm going to readdress some of those, and then I'll specifically talk about the issue of intermittent fasting or not. If you are suffering from gout and you're looking for a way to put gout in remission following the protocols that I've talked about. So there's a couple things uh, to remember about gout and its relationship to our metabolics. The first is, is that most people that suffer from gout also are suffering from metabolic syndrome. And I'm listing on the slide here um, many, many of the um, the characteristics of metabolic syndrome. So generally speaking, if you have blood work done, you find that uh, these individuals have high triglycerides. Uh, they may have a high fasting glucose, but not necessarily. Um, probably low HDL in uh, the medical establishment, they talk about the HDL as being the good cholesterol. Um, high blood pressure is very common. Hypertensive individuals or 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 what the doctor will call even pre-hypertensive individuals, a high waist to height ratio. What does this mean? If you take a tape measure and you uh, take a circumference around literally the top of the belly button, that ratio, that circumference in inches divided by the total inches of height uh, with a ratio of 0.5 or greater indicates insulin resistance. And remember at the core of all of this, not to oversimplify it, but the, at the core of gout is insulin resistance along the lines of these other potential comorbidities that an individual suffering from gout can also be suffering from. So let's take a look at that. So here I'm talking about uh, somebody who is hyperuricemic, maybe already suffering from gout. If you look at the statistics, which I'm not going to run through today, but I've done that in a lot of presentations, you can see that there are, are a lot of associated um, metabolic disorders with somebody who is suffering from gout, like kidney disease, diabetes, significant obesity, fatty liver disease, Alzheimer's even, cardiovascular disease is typical. And then I've also added to this sugar and alcohol addiction because there, there is now uh, concerted evidence about the connection between the biochemical driver, right? I've talked about this in past presentations, the survival switch, when it's activated, which generates intracellular uric acid, the fact that this pathway is connected to the food reward system in the brain by concerted signaling, taste metabolically from the liver and the gut brain axis. And now I've seen literature that characterizes a protein that is produced in by, by um, neurons in the nucleus accumbens, which is considered a biomarker for substance abuse. And that's not the topic of today's presentation. So I'm going to leave that where it's sitting, but food cravings, cravings for alcohol and sugar are, are driven biochemically. And so they are part of the comorbidity that we see somebody suffering from gout may also have issues being able to give up the two central drivers of gout not saying that there aren't other factors, but the two central factors being alcohol and sugar, mainly the fructose that's in the sugar. Having to give those up can be problematic. So first and foremost, gout remission requires giving up sugar and alcohol and processed food because processed food has a substantial amount of added sugars in it along with uh, seed oils, which are also bad, that stuff needs to be given up. 
what are we going to be eating? We switch to eating real and whole food that we cut up and we cook every single day for every single meal that we have, right? Maybe the meal prep involves cooking enough of something in an evening so that you then have lunch or breakfast um, that's already prepared for the next day, for example. To look more formally at what a gout remission outline looks like, again, we're giving up the sugar and the alcohol and the processed food. We're eating real food. Um, when if you're run, if you're excuse me, if you're thinking about what do I mean exactly by sugar? All right, this is also going to include giving up uh, grains, potatoes. Uh, it's going to be any type of potato and um, and any type of grain including any type of rice, for example, and then the added sugars, which I've already talked about, but sugars come in a lot of different forms. And, and I have found through experience working with clients that when people first start down the road of this lifestyle, that oftentimes they don't know all the different forms of sugar. So this is something that you have to educate yourself about. We're talking about everything from table sugar, high fructose corn syrups, agave syrups, which are particularly really bad, and even honey, which everyone has learned over decades. Well, there's all kinds of nutrients and things in there that are really good for us, but honey happens to be 55% fructose, which is instrumental in, in this biochemical driver. And then the processed food, which is including all kinds of different added sugars in everything that I just uh, mentioned. Um, a ketogenic diet, if you choose to go down the road of actually cutting into the carbs more, then what does that lifestyle look like? It's going to be around 5% um, carbohydrate total. Um, you're going to be somewhere around 20% protein. I'm going to actually talk about the calculation that you do to sort out where you ought to be on that and then the rest is going to be 75% fat, but we're talking about healthy fats, um, excluding the seed oils, things like soybean oil, flax, flaxseed oil, and so on, not excluding oils like olive oil or avocado oil um, that would be in the diet, along with things like ghee and lard and beef tallow and so on, natural and healthy fats. We're going to keep the carbs. Basically, if you want an actual grammage, we're, we need to have those carbs coming in at no more than about 50 grams of total carbs per day. If you also are somebody suffering from gout and type 2 diabetes, for example, you're probably going to want to go lower on the total carbs, um, just as a head, heads up about that. And a target protein is going to be somewhere around 16 ounces a day, somewhere around 16 ounces per day. because all of us are different. We have different body weights. We also have different activity levels. And that has to be evaluated when we when we start to look at our, our total protein every day. I'm eating more protein than that, but that's because I'm super active and I need to have more protein in my diet to help my muscles recover and for me to actually feel, feel well. How did I sort this out? It's trial and error. You know, I, I started with a target and then I moved up literally evaluating how I felt and also monitoring my uric acid production. And I'll come back to that. Now, this is not that complicated. A lot of people, when they think about how am I going to eat in a lifestyle where I've cut the sugar and so on, and now I'm cutting into the carbs and I want to be around 50 grams of total per day. It's not, I teach, it's not that complicated. I teach the plate method. So if you visualize a plate and you split it into three portions, two of the portions will have keto approved green vegetables that are low in carbohydrate, high in fiber. And then the, the other portion of the plate is going to have some protein in it. And that protein amount, if you want a, a visualization, is going to be around the size of a deck of cards or a fat wallet that fits in the back pocket of a man. And again, we'll talk about the calculation in a minute. But this slide, I give you actual examples of the protein, of the fats, and of several green listed vegetables. So you may want to pause the presentation here and just write, write this information down. It's a place to get started. 
keep it simple, right? There's no reason actually to, to go out and start calculating percentages of macros. It's overly complicated and actually inaccurate. This is a much easier way to do things and it will target, it will put you into your target range of 50 grams of total carbs per day with no problems. And when you combine it with biomarker monitoring, uh, this is the way to go. Simplicity. This is just to show you some examples. Any of you that actually follow my channel have probably seen this slide before, but I think it's necessary for anyone who's new. This is just giving you an example. This is my food. These are pictures of, of plates of food that I ate right after taking the picture. And you can see um, there's a couple of examples here on the far left on the bottom and far right on the bottom. You can see the plate method in action. It's uh, The plate has been broken into three parts. Um, you can see uh, if we focus on the one on the right, there's pork loin in the upper um, a third of that plate. And then I've got roasted Brussels sprouts and yellow squash um, in, the, in the lower half split into the thirds. That type of meal is going to is going to issue great biomarkers and eating this way over the course of the day is going to keep you within that 50 grams of total carbs. If you're thinking about, well, what do you do for breakfast, Dr. Pete? There's two um, um, breakfast options there on the upper left-hand uh, corner of the slide. Actually, it's breakfast going all the way across the top. But if we start on the far left, I've got three eggs that were cooked fried eggs that were cooked over easy on a bed of chicken liver. Yeah, you can eat chicken liver. Um, and so, But some of you are going, but but Dr. Pete, uh, doesn't that have a high purine load? Well, yes, it does. So what does that mean? It means that you monitor biomarkers with this. You see what the effect is on you, right? And then the other part of it is, no, I'm not eating that every day, right? I mean, again, a lot of this gout remission has to do with going from extreme ways of eating, which is in the standard American um, uh, model for, for food, to moderation. And chicken liver has a lot of really good stuff in it. So I do eat it, but I just don't eat it every single day, right? And, um, and I don't eat it that often, but I do eat it. The next plate to the right is an omelet, and you can see that, that it's loaded with keto approved vegetables and there's cream cheese in there. And then there's some sausage and, you know, you can argue, well, the sausage is a processed food. Yes. But I bought this sausage from a place where I live that makes homemade different types of meats. And I have tested this sausage does not have sugar in it. And I've tested this sausage by monitoring my biomarkers. And I know that it doesn't spike my glucose and it also doesn't substantially raise my uric acid, so I can eat it, right? So this is driving home um, two messages here, keeping things simple, sticking to the plate method, right? And using biomarker monitoring to make common sense decisions about the whole and real food that I'm eating. And again, this is to emphasize biomarkers I, I measure to, to uh, the, these days, remember, I'm almost four years into this, and sometimes I don't measure my bio, biomarkers. But in the first couple of years, I did this every single day. And, uh, and that included my weight, my ketones, fasting, fasting weight, fasting ketones, fasting blood pressure, and also my glucose and my uric acid, which you can see on the meter there on the right. This meter was from UA Sure. Back then, this was the only meter that you could get. Now there are other options. So I, don't, I would encourage you to look around. I have links to meters um, um, on my website, Dr. Pete, uh, www.drpeteandt.com. Uh, also down in the show notes that you, you can check out. Okay, this is just uh, showing you a slide of my own data. You can see in 2019 that my uric acid values were actually pretty high, right? This is typical when you start the ketogenic diet because, and I've talked about this a lot, when you lower the carbs, you lower the insulin, um, your um, 
uh, you're going to start producing ketones because of the fat burning. And when ketones are excreted at the level of the urine, it, it backs up the uric acid and you see this rise. What you can see is a, a year later, right, in 2020, that black section of points is now literally lower. And that's because I have keto adapted. And you can see my uric acid is centered around seven, which means that in year two, it was it became evident to me that I was hyperuricemic. This is where the cutoff is for men. In women, it's about six mg per de deciliter for hyperuricemia. For men, it's seven mg per deciliter for hyperuricemia. And then you can see the red cluster of points. This is this was in 2021 when I went on all up here and all for the first time. And you can see how that system of points was pulled down basically um, approximately a full unit. Um, and then these days, my uric acid averages around 5.5. I'm taking quercetin, tart cherry, and I'm on 200 milligrams of um, allopurinol per day. That's not really the subject of the of the presentation today. So I'm going to go ahead and move on. If you've got questions about that, put them in my uh, put them in the comments section on, on the channel, YouTube channel, and I will get back to you about it. So if you're going to fast, what do I think you need to do first? So first, I think you need to get your lifestyle under control and really understand where you are. And if you've cut, um, you've cut out the processed food, you've stopped the alcohol and you've stopped um, the sugar and you've cut into the carbs, after keto adaption, what happens with most people is they naturally evolve to a point where they're only eating two meals a day. Is this black and white? No, it's not. Again, if you're someone like me who's super active, most of the time I'm eating two meals a day, but sometimes depending on my hunger level, I'm eating three meals or I have um, a keto snack in the middle of the afternoon. Um, the issue about hunger, this the keto lifestyle is not a calorie restricted lifestyle. We are, we are not going, okay, I'm going on to the ketogenic diet now and and I'm going to restrict my calories. This is not a diet in the way that people think about diet superficially, right? We This is a lifestyle where we've cut into the carbs, but we are eating enough every day, literally, not to be hungry. We're eating our fill, right? And we are eating to satiation. And normally, if somebody is keto adapted, they have naturally come to a place where they're only eating about two meals a day because that literally is what their hunger is driving them to do. Not because I start the ketogenic diet and this guy on the internet said that I'm only going to eat two meals a day. That's not how this is working, right? We're, we are sensitive to the hormonal signals that we now are encountering in our body when we're eating a low carb lifestyle and most people are eating two meals a day as a result of that signaling literally now what does that mean it means that there will be for most people a natural fasting eating window this is this naturally happens because if you're eating two meals a day and most most individuals are eating mid morning right that first meal which is usually a fairly substantial meal. Like I'm having four eggs usually along with some type of protein in combination with that. And the meal has a certain amount of fat in it. And then I'm not eating again literally until about five in the afternoon where I have my dinner, which generally speaking is the three-way plate in a literal sense, along with a large salad. And again, there's a fat content there. When you eat this way, it produces a 16-8 window. So the eating window is within approximately eight hours, plus or minus, right? This is not a black and white thing. I'm not getting up and keeping it a chart every day, right? This is just naturally happens. And the fasting part of it is about anywhere from 12 to 16 hours. So my point is, if you're eating the ketogenic lifestyle, you are naturally 
going to to um, find yourself evolving to this fasting eating uh, relationship without doing anything special. And then remember, oh, and this is something you may not remember because I don't know how much I've actually talked about this. But for me in the hyperuricemia business and the gout remission, remember there is a relationship around the amount of ketones you're producing and the uric acid because the ketones are going to be preferentially excreted at the level of the kidney. So I have found in my own lifestyle by eating in a way, tweaking, you know, how much protein versus how much the vegetables and, and, and the fat, the keeping my ketone output, which I know by finger sticking and measuring my ketones, if I keep my ketones between 0.5 millimolar and 1 millimolar, that this allows me to keep my uric acid uh, in a range that's around five and a half. And again, Yes, I'm doing the tart cherry, the carcetin, and, and 200 milligrams of allopurinol. All of this stuff needs to come together because you're dealing with a complex system when we're talking about um, metabolics. And my point here is that you want to take things one step at a time. You know, you cut, you cut out the sugar and the alcohol and you go to eating whole food. Then you make the decision about whether you're going to cut into the carbs. Um, and then you get keto adapted. After keto adaption and really understanding where you are, then when you want to think about the fasting business, that's when you do it, right? You don't want to go, okay, uh, I want to do something about this gout. And then you just throw everything at the wall and do it all at once because Honestly, you're going to have a really hard time in a scenario like that trying to sort out, you know, what's going on, especially if you start having gout flares, right? What's causing it? Well, how do you know if you're trying to do all of this at once? So this is a step-by-step, -step, take things uh, carefully, be very patient and expect to do this over the long run. So to finish uh, the video for today, intermittent fasting, not before you get keto adapted, right? And some of you, when you cut out the alcohol and sugar and you go to whole food, you may not need to cut into the carbs, right? Remember, you need to evaluate your metabolic situation. That requires blood work and looking at where you are in terms of the metabolic syndrome, right? Or maybe these other potential comorbidity problems like diabetes and the um, uh, significant obesity, cardiovascular, you need to know where you are in that whole uh, setting uh, because that's going to dictate what you do next after cutting the alcohol and the sugar um, and, and whether or not you need to cut into the carbs, right? Again, this goes back to what I was saying about being systematic and careful with this. The fasting honestly, besides what happens naturally on the ketogenic diet, may not be a good idea. And the reason for that is because fasting is going to elevate the ketones. And I have found that when my ketones get above one, that's where I see a significant like related uh, rise in my uric acid. When I keep my ketones between 0.5 and 1, this seems to be the sweet spot for me. How do I know that? Because I've taken my time and I've monitored my biomarkers so that I know where this stuff happens with me. All right. And with that, I'm going to close. I'd like to thank you all for watching today. Um, you can find our coaching programs and also more information on supplements at our website, www.drpeatnt.com. Also, I list the, the various links uh, and, and ver uh, to the supplements and other things in our show notes. Again, thank you for watching today, and I will see you next week.